What is going on, everyone? Today is October 23rd, 2024. My name is Anthony Santini. You're tuned into the Invested in Hockey podcast today. I am joined with Eric Wilson. And one day after the frozen frenzy done in the NHL, where all 16 or sorry, 16 games were played, all 32 teams playing was complete last night. One of the latest games actually puck drop was 1120, which was ridiculous. I was thinking about it. I don't even know if there's been a puck drop that late before where I actually ended up watching a little bit of the game, but that just found so that just seems so late for me. And overall, I mean, it was a pretty good experience. We'll get into what we both thought. We're going to talk about the introduction to the season and how everything's been shaping out so far, a little bit of our predictions and how they've been turning out. But Eric, what'd you think about the free agent or sorry, the frozen frenzy? I was impressed. I think uh, I had a couple games on uh, TSN slash Sportsnet, and they they did a good job of kind of going back to the uh, to the panel and and talking about the other games that were going on. So, although they weren't flipping through on my end, um, I was able to see the other scores without having to kind of scroll on my phone, scroll on Twitter, whatever it was. So it, it was pretty pretty good. I knew uh, I knew what was happening, and I knew what was happening to uh, to our Bruins too. So. <laughs> Yeah, it was a tough game for the Bruins. Bruins lose 4 nothing to Nashville last night. Unfortunately, I started Jeremy Swayman too, which absolutely sucks. But a couple games that I had my eye on and I was watching last night, I was watching Colorado-Seattle. Um, I know we were talking about Justice and Noonan and maybe him emerging as a starting goaltender in Colorado. And it seems like the path that he's on right now is going to help um, make that decision for the coaching staff he played a great game last night winning 3-2 against Seattle and he did let in a little bit of a tough goal to stop with about four or five seconds Mm -hmm. left it doesn't really tell the true tale of uh how he played I thought he played really good really solid let in two goals two being and maybe I'm being a little bit biased but not exactly his fault the second was a little bit of a squeaky rebound that came out in a tough um and great shot but either way, I, I do think eventually Anunan will become the starting goalie in Colorado. But besides that, was there any other games that you were watching, Eric? Um, I, I will say that even though I didn't watch every game, the one I can promise that Edmonton versus Carolina was probably the most entertaining five minute overtime I've I've seen in a long time. Well, I didn't even know um, that game went to overtime. Edmonton played Carolina. Um, without even having to give too much of a recap, McDavid scored two goals. Uh, Oilers were up 2-0, and, and the Canes kind of stormed back, uh, brought it to overtime, and it was a hell of a game, and we're going to get to our breakout candidates soon, but one of your breakout candidates scored um, the overtime winner on a 1-T, and it was, it was it was nasty. So um, our viewers are going to have to go into uh, YouTube after and watch that, that overtime because that was literally the best five minutes of my night. So, Wow. Yeah, I didn't even know that game went into overtime. That was kind of the one thing for me personally that I felt if the NHL is going to do this, I feel like they need to navigate somehow like a red zone type of program where you can watch everything all at once because there was a lot of games going on. I didn't really know what to tune into. There's a lot of games starting, obviously, fifteen every 15 minutes. I believe after 6 o'clock, there was one new game going on or every half an hour, something like yeah. that. It's a lot going on. It's a lot of great hockey, a lot of great games. And I feel like it takes a lot to organize this. So I do commend the NHL. If I were to have my one piece or my two cents per se to not fix, but maybe make this a little bit better. I feel like having one single broadcast, maybe could it be on Amazon Prime? Could it be like how Prime did the Leafs game on uh, Monday night? I think it could be a good idea because I just kind of found myself bouncing uh, back and forth to channels being lost a little bit. I know that you said you were kind of on the ball, but I feel like a red zone type of show would be just awesome for this. Yeah, I think I, I see where you're coming from. I also should mention Amazon Prime since you brought it up. I'm a little skeptical about it because I know a lot of people have Amazon and know what it is, but then, you know, you hear people who don't really follow it, don't do the online shopping thing, and so they don't have access to Prime yeah, uh, Prime Mondays, which I'm glad it's just a Monday thing for now. But maybe yeah. in a few years, once Prime is like, you know, solidified for everyone, then uh, they can kind of go with, with the red zone style. But it's a good question, it's something to consider. Yeah. Um, with all the changing ownerships and you know, fanatics, this, uh, you know, all the sports channels changing and stuff, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, what other games did you kind of kind of see a score and go, wow? I mean, the one that really, really stood out was definitely um, 
Leafs Columbus. I think that oh, game yeah. ended 6-1 or 6-2, which Oof. for me very surprising because Dennis Hildeby played so great against New Jersey last week. He comes Oof. in against Columbus and looking to get his second win in the NHL. I thought he was going to do it, but this just kind of boasts the idea that Anthony Stolarz is the standout lone starting goaltender for the Toronto Maple Leafs, at least for now, until Joseph Wall could come back and contest that idea. I think the Leafs are still a good team, not as good as people think, but that was definitely a game and losing on Saturday night against the New York Rangers. Two games back to back where you kind of say, okay, well, the Leafs just lost to one of the better teams in the NHL and the Rangers, and then they go on and lose on the road against Columbus. It's kind of uh, the word I was looking for was measuring stick is a what I was hearing when I was reading and listening to some of the comments about this Maple Leaf team right now, yeah. and the measuring stick test against New York obviously came up short. They lost and obviously um, losing to Columbus is a major, excuse me, major step back. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I will mention they, they were on a back to back. So I, I'll give them that Columbus loss with a backup goalie in that. Like um, they did get the win against Tampa, which I, they must've looked good. I didn't really watch that game either, but um, you can't throw a stinker on a back to back. We we saw that game against Columbus last year where they uh they lost like six five and Kent Johnson got the OT winner. I don't know if you remember that game, but um, oh, that was last year. Yeah, yeah, it was last year, and it was it was it was Samsonov, one of those turning points where he could not get a win, and it just seems like maybe that's going to be what happens with uh with Hill to be where you we almost don't want to start him. So yeah, no, I totally get it. Um, yeah, that game was was definitely one where you'd maybe expect the Leafs to win. I'll, I'll bring up a game that I got to watch the end of, and it was Calgary and Pittsburgh. Did you watch that at all? No. So uh, Calgary ended up winning this one in a shootout, I think in like the fifth round of the shootout. And the goal scorer was the Costco guy. Have you heard of the Costco guy before? The Costco guys? Not the Costco guys. That's the, See, that's uh, that's where I'm getting you a little. There's a guy named Justin Kirkland on Calgary. And okay. they they call him the Costco guy because his last name's Kirkland. Kirkland, yeah. Um, and he he scored his first goal. If I guess like ten days ago for Calgary, like oh, like, I saw that. Isn't he like twenty eight years old? I think. Yeah, he, and exactly. Yeah. So this is like a great story and all. But but when I saw someone say the Costco guy, I'm like, oh my goodness, you you, you almost can't call him that, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he scored. He ripped it for a, a shootout winner, and then uh, Malkin went the other way and couldn't score. So Dustin Wolf is three and zero. Oh, the Flames are three and zero oh at home, and that kind of caught my eye. I was like, wow. Um, man, they, they're, they're, they're chugging, you know? Yeah. There's some really good Canadian teams playing some hockey right now. Obviously the Leafs haven't been great. We just talked about that. Winnipeg's been phenomenal. They're now six and oh, and Hellebuck still shuts down. He's just one of the best goaltenders in the league. I think yeah. he could go back to back with the Vesna. And for me personally, having him in fantasy, I'm more than happy to hold on to him because my goalie categories for, um, NHL fantasy have just been off the charts. The past, I mean, ever since I traded for Hellebuck, he's really helped. So yeah, yeah. Now any NHL fantasy will disagree. They've been talking all the last two weeks about how you almost can't trust like any goalie, and they they meant they actually were able to mention Hellebuck as one of those only guys, like you're saying, yeah. who you, you can trust. Um, and and it's just hard to give any goalie advice to anyone right now if you're uh whether you're a fantasy geek, a betting geek, whatever you are, you you can't. There's not many guys you can say okay. Um, this guy's going to turn it up because we, yeah. we just don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that game was, uh, that game was pretty incredible. There was, uh, again, like you were saying, lots of flipping on the TV, but, um, Hellebuck played the full six. He, he made a game saving stop there at the end. I don't know if you saw that. On yeah. Kind of like off the toe. I was watching that too. That was unreal. And like, that's, that's what a, a Vezina winner does. Right. And so, yeah. um, I hope to see that out of more goalies this year, whether it's, uh, you know, Maybe like a Linus Allmark who stands on his head once he's back. Um, maybe it's a Jake Ottinger who's just gonna carry Dallas to that number one seed. Like, th- there's a lot of goalies that um we can't talk about because there's so many. But um, seeing Hellebuck there and seeing the Jets six and zero, it, it makes you you just can't doubt them right now, right? Oh, for sure, for sure, yeah. one of the better teams in the league. Yeah, how about Kyle Connor? Five goals. What are you, what are your thoughts on him? I was talking to George about him last night too, actually, our buddy George, because we were talking about people that could kind of go out and still win the Rocket. And mm-hmm. Kyle Connor, who we talked about last year, is such a good goal scorer, scores from everywhere, part of the ice he could create. He has a wicked shot, and this year he's just really turning it up to that line that he plays on too. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. Shifley's been playing amazing this year, and I feel like 
the Jets can make a big, big push this year, but it's all going to depend on how well Hellebuck can take, or sorry, how far Hellebuck can take them. Yeah, it's 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 really going to depend on that, and it makes me. <clears throat> I've questioned this a little. I uh, I was watching the games with my dad last night, and I, I said something. I said, you know, we might see a change in this whole rocket conversation if we're if we see wingers start to win it more. Um, yeah. you know, if we see centermen like McDavid, uh, McKinnon, Matthews, if we see these guys start to become uh, more of the all the playmaker type, which a lot of them are playmakers, but if we're seeing them dish the puck to wingers and wingers kind of be the the go to guy like a Pasta or a Kyle Connor, um, it might be we get some interesting talks in here because. You know, everyone kind of had Matthews. Uh, I don't want to say everyone, but Matthews is a consensus guy. You'd, you'd think at the Rocket, right? Yep. Um, but then you you look at players with a skill set like Matthews, um, and if they play the wing, it they play a completely different game, right? Like their responsibilities are so different. Um, we know how Matthews is. We're like he can be physical if he wants to, but you know his responsibilities just completely different than. Um, a winger like Clayton Keller or a, a guy like Jack Hughes, if he hops on the wing rather than center, right? So oh, it, for sure. such an interesting conversation to me, especially with uh, dual eligibility just coming out in uh, our ESPN fantasy leagues too. Yeah. So no. wait, dual eligibility. Yeah. Did so it? they, <clears throat> they just released <clears throat> some, uh, some dual eligibility wingers. So, Oh, what really? I didn't even know. I was kind of, yeah. Really, yeah. What, in our, <clears throat> our fantasy lab, I'm going to um, put on. Yeah, you have to check it out. They they did it in uh I know it was in my one league, but they they actually did update the players. Um Oh yeah, look at that. Look at Paterka, yeah. left wing, right wing. Yeah, you're right. And you know what? When we started the season, that was one of the things I was looking at. And I was saying, like, what all players just have one position, but I guess what yeah. they were gonna do was probably start off the season with everyone at one position and then add to it as they go. Yeah. Which totally makes sense. I mean, I don't know if there's anyone off the top of my head that I could kind of pull up and say this could be a benefit right now. I see Owen Tippett left wing, right wing. Yeah. Um anyone on my team like <laughs> talk about JJ Paterka, like I said, left wing, right wing. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh but no one else too notable that I see with a change like that. But that's always great to see when uh you can you can get those so i'll have to update the boys and let them know i know when you can count on a guy like Tippett who hasn't done anything and you can say okay at least he has the dual eligibility then i can keep him and not just drop the guy right yeah. like it, it's yeah. it's that frustration that that kicks in and kind of as i bring up frustration i i don't want to be too negative on this the podcast but there are a lot of uh a lot of analyzing to do on some defensemen and forwards in terms of their their scoring so um, I think we should get to our breakout candidates and then we can kind of move to the the slow starts, uh, which we've seen some from some players. Yeah, beauty. So first off, your number one guy, and I feel like this is pretty sharp looking at this list right now, our breakout candidates. So shout out us because I feel like we uh we're pretty sharp. I'm uh, I'm extremely you, proud. Yeah, go, yeah, yeah. You, go you ahead starting off right now, you had Dylan Gunther as your forward to break out, and his first three games were absolutely unreal. The hype he had going into that fourth game was crazy. Now I believe it's game six or game seven. A little bit of a slump in scoring. I believe it's three or four games without a goal. But that was just unreal. Obviously, one yeah. of the better forwards in the NHL, and we've seen it with his sports cards that we've talked about. They've just oh, yeah. absolutely skyrocketed, and everyone's just wanting a piece of some Dylan Gunther. Uh, yeah, in yeah, buy in, right buy in, right? <laughs> oh yeah, and then yeah, your forward. We'll go to your forward here with the OT winner. I'll let you uh, announce it there. Yeah, so I had Sebastian Aho. I thought it was one of the. Uh, one of the plays where, you know, an older player could really break out, become one of those better players in the league. And, I mean, he has started okay, not as good as Gunther. So, I'm going to give you a point for this one. Taking Gunther there definitely got me beat. But last night, beating Edmonton. And to talk about that Edmonton team, I know there's always so much to talk about. And it feels like a weird discussion considering they had a similar start, maybe worse, last year and still made it to Game 7 Stanley Cup Final. Yeah, this Edmonton team's really struggling. Obviously, Aho with the game winner last night, and I feel like he's in for one of his better, if not best, seasons in his young NHL career. Yeah, it was. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. Aho's one of the like select guys who's at that age that again you identified where he hasn't hit the 100 point mark, but he's also been just shy of like the 85 90 range. So this yeah. year that could be a full breakout where he hits 90 points and carries that line of. Uh, 
you know, Jarvis Svechnikov Aho, which is a is a nasty, nasty yeah. line there. But they uh again a, a great game to watch, best five minutes of overtime um that filled my day yesterday. So um I, I still love that candidate from you. Yep. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, both of us actually had the same defenseman coming up next, which he started out unreal in our yeah. um, in our fantasy league as well, in our category yeah. league. He's season rank nine, I believe. I don't know what it is wow. last night, but I was looking at that before the game. He's been crazy. I don't know which round he got drafted in very late, but on that power play in Ottawa, which has been very, very talented, I believe he has four or five points or power play points. Yeah. It's been an unreal start for Jake Sanderson, and we both picked him. So I guess you could say half point for us. So you're kind we'll of still we'll up on me. Whatever. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's been great for him. I really think Sanderson's going to have a great year. And that power play is what needs to tick if this Ottawa Senators team wants to make the playoffs. And they're doing that right now. Stutzel looks good. Kachuk looks good. Allmark's a little banged up. I know Forsberg was in last night. Yeah. But I feel like Sanderson was a great, great pick yeah. from both of us. 100%. And uh, going into our attendees here, I'll let you uh, introduce yours. Yeah, so pretty much we both picked two pretty good goaltenders that I think are starting off great. I'm going to give myself this one for now, but I think in the future you can slowly in the next couple weeks um, get the win on this one. So I had Dustin Wolf winning um, as my breakout candidate. You had Justice and Noonan, which I think right now Wolf is playing better, but and Noonan mm-hmm. will end up being the starting goaltender on the Colorado Avalanche. Ultimately, I think you'll have the better um, pick for this one. But I do think both goaltenders start off to a really great hot start. Anunan is two has two wins under his belt. Obviously, started off the season uh, taking relief for Gorgiev, which unfortunately yeah. he kind of got lit up going in both games, led in two goals and terrible goals against average for those that have him in mm-hmm. fantasy. But it is what it is. He's playing great when he's stern. I think we were both very sharp with uh, with these picks. I know. I don't think this is something we can replicate next year. We, we're gonna have to have uh, some pretty high stakes on. Who our breakout candidates are because again it, they've started out you know pretty picture perfect whether that's a noon and having a few starts under his belt or wolf being three and oh i don't think we ever would imagine wolf to be you know undefeated after seven games uh splitting time with fladar right so yep. um i'll give i'll totally give you the full point there and i guess that means we we end in a tie with our breakout candidates so um <clears throat> definitely something we're gonna have to revisit in uh call it six weeks or something in uh maybe by episode 40 oh yeah um, and I think that's going to lead me into the um, the more negative uh, side of breaking out. And maybe we get into um, things like sophomore slumps, um, slow starts, whatever it is. I have a bit of a list. I'm going to read it off to you and kind of hear your thoughts. Um, and if I'm being too critical, I, I, I need to hear it. So uh, we'll get into that if you're, uh, if you're ready to hear it, Sans. Ready. Let's hear it. So starting off um, – this list was made yesterday before Frozen Frenzy. Not much has changed, but uh, there may be a, a player to – actually, I know there's a player on this list too. Is not pointless anymore, but um, I'm going to keep it simple and just start with pointless players. Um, yep. And I'm going to relate it to the contract that they're on just to add a bit of a twist to it. So I'm going to start off here with Alex Kalorn. He's making $6.25 million. Dollars and he has zero points in uh, his first five games with the Ducks. So, um, you know, highest guy on this list in terms of AAV, and I was a little shocked to see he hadn't contributed yet. But, um, I don't know if, uh, what your thoughts on Kalorn are. Yeah, it's kind of one of those positions where he signed with the Ducks. Um, I believe two seasons ago or last off season. They gave him the bag, and it was kind of to come in and be a leader for that team. Obviously, a Stanley Cup champion that has many, many accolades in the NHL regarding his NHL career. And I think he was a good pickup for the Ducks, but definitely not one of the flashiest in the league. It's going to be a struggle. I know you kind of talked about that Anaheim Ducks team being uh, – I, I forget the phrase that you use, but not offensively talented, I guess, could um, put a picture in your mind for those listening. But I don't think the Ducks are going to be a very talented team. I don't think Alex Klorn is going to take them there either to uh, overcome those that struggle. Yeah, just not not pretty from that team. You'd think you would be a little, you know, you'd think you'd want to be picture perfect on on things like the power play, which didn't look that bad. Um, I'll bring on the next candidate now, 
um, which is Cutter Goche. So he actually scored. Uh, I think he might have gotten two points last night, but he had a power play assist on uh, Leo Carlson's goal. Um, but I am still a little worried about him. He's on the fourth line playing top power play. Um, I, I don't know if he'll be in the NHL for the whole year. I don't know about what you think there. I, th- I think he'll be in the NHL for the full year. I don't think he's going to be a good NHL player for the full year. He's going to have his struggles. I think when I uh, was looking at some over-unders for uh, futures, they had his goal total at like 22 or 23 and a half. Obviously, I grabbed the under because I don't think he's going to be able to hit that over. He would have to play all 82 games to really do that. We saw yeah. Dylan Gunther last year score like 14 goals in 30 games or whatever it was, something like that, or 14 goals in 40 games. And that was even with him being the sniper he is. So for Cutter Goche, I don't think he's going to play all 82 in the NHL. But I do think that one day he will be a very talented NHL player. I like that take. I like that. I'll uh, I'll move into a guy on the Devils. Making $6 million. Um, he's minus six on the year and he has zero points. Andre Palat. Oh, geez. It's just one of those players like way too overpaid. I don't think he really um, will be able to get up to that production for his price point. I think the Devils are still going to be a good team. But for me, I'm not really looking at Andre Pollock to have a bounce back. uh, Yeah, it's I didn't even realize I just put two former Lightning players kind of back to back. It was not the intention. But, you know, you can kind of see what happens when two guys are in their 30s and you sign them to six million AAVs, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. Tough start for him. Um, next up is David Perron on the Ottawa Senators. Um, he's making $4 million, um, on a eight, on a two year deal. So four and four, um, for eight mil and you know what? Zero points. Um, he's minus four. It's just, I don't think he's, uh, really helped them at all, but maybe he's just trying to find his role on that team. Yeah. It's kind of one of those, uh, it's one of those times in the year where you can't really, you don't really want to panic early, even because it's been a slow start, but you know that some of these players are so talented. When you look at some of these stat lines, we always talk fantasy too, where people try and say like buy low. And I feel like it could be a good opportunity to do just that if you could. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, that that's a good point, especially in deep leagues. You got to buy low on a guy who's got, um, you know, four four points three points two points nothing crazy like even the guy with one point um that leads me into i guess a buy low candidate um victor arvidson he he's the guy that i think everyone should be talking about because the oilers market is is up there he uh seven games now zero points i I don't know what to think of him yeah it's weird i mean in the offseason when he was signed everyone was saying Oh, McDavid's lineman, McDavid's lineman. But I mean, the same was said about Hyman. The same was said about Jeff Skinner. Like you can only have two players on this guy's line. And we already know how well he clicks with Leon Dreisaitl. So I don't think that, you know, having someone on the Oilers is really going to skyrocket their price. Sure, maybe they could find themselves on the power play. But Victor Arvidsson hasn't even sniffed any talented, like, ice, any sorry, any talented um I lost my train of thought there a little bit, but any uh, form of offensive yeah. uh, production so far this year, I know he was touted to play on a line with McDavid or that's what everyone was talking about in the off season. He hasn't done that at all. Yeah. I, I just, uh, yeah, it worries me because again, we know he's a good player and stuff, but the biggest issue I saw, and I, this is where I'd love to see if I'm wrong, I'd love to hear it, but the Oilers only could rely on, on Bouchard, McDavid, dry and like Nugent Hopkins on that, in that overtime and that by the last minute of overtime, like <clears throat> you had no one to throw out there. Right. So yeah, <clears throat> I was just worried. Why aren't you throwing out Arvid Sanders Skinner in overtime? If the Canes can throw out Natchez, Brent Burns at the end of the day, it's a team game. It's a depth game. And and by the yeah. fifth minute of overtime, you don't think McDavid's going to be gassed. He, uh, he didn't even come back in the zone. Um, he, he basically tried to get a breakaway out of nothing. And, uh, Carolina just sauced the puck over Bouchard's stick and went in for the one T. So um, again, I won't bring the McDavid slander in here. I'll continue with this list um, because I know we got to wrap things up, but Zach Benson, uh, six games minus four and zero points heading into last night. Uh, A little worried about him uh, just because he's not on that top line. Yeah. I think because the play of Paterka has really thrown off Zach Benson's, um, Zach Benson's ability to get on that first line. Paterka played so well, obviously missing two or three games to a concussion, but he has a couple goals already. And Benson, a very talented player. I don't know if he's going to be able 
to get um, as one of the more important players on that first line. But I do think he's a talented player. He's going to have a great career. And right now, it's been a slow start for him. I don't see any fantasy value for him. But I do think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for him on a team that isn't that great. Yeah, I, I think the opportunity is there, and I think he's going to have to get his confidence up. Maybe maybe gets moved to the fourth line, like a similar to like a cutter Gauthier move, and maybe that helps him change his overall game. Because I, I don't know, I don't watch enough Buffalo, but I I want to want to see him do well, right? So yeah, um, sure. I I do think the best way to wrap this up is to bring up the the biggest surprise on on this list for me, and I'll do so by making you guess a little bit. I actually I feel like I told you, so I'm I'm just going to kind of go into it, but um. Miro Heiskanen uh, threw seven games at zero points, and I'm just, I'm just, I don't know, I don't know what to say, but I'm a little shocked. Yeah, I kind of had Miro as one of the, um, as one of the better players to kind of win. I don't really want to say he was going to win the Norris, but at least I had him in the top three conversation because he is one of the more talented yeah. defensive. You would think he'd be a little bit more offensively talented with such a great power play in Dallas, but I just don't think that the ability for him to score points has always been his, you know, high mark. I did see his line being at like 64 and a half to start the season. I did say to myself, like, that is really, really low, which I thought it was. But even now, if you took that under, I think you uh, you really are laughing. Yeah, that's it. it it's honestly just it shocked me because. Along with him, uh, Issa Lindell and Nils Lundqvist also on that blue line with zero points. I was a little shocked that I'm thinking that Dallas is just so offensively talented where they don't always need to use the point or something. But um, yeah, Heiskanen, it, it's making me think of like, uh, I don't want to compare Heiskanen to McAvoy, but McAvoy does not produce offensively. We know this. Yeah. Um, he doesn't produce on those levels that, you know, Makar and Bouchard do. And, and it seems like Heiskanen's turning into that style too, where you're going to try and get 50 points. 50 points in your 82 games and um, be a, a stud defensively in your own end. And and maybe that's enough for, uh, for guys like that in that tier two conversation. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. And so it's, it's just really interesting to me, but I think that was a, a nice segment to wrap up with. The only other guys I'll mention really fast are um, Will Smith and Morgan geeky guys who are pointless uh, and are kind of notable that were uh, when I was doing my research. So yeah. Nice. All right. Well, I mean, that kind of wraps up for uh, that kind of wraps it up for us this week. I know shout out that my bird for singing the last couple of minutes. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed that because it definitely threw me off, kind of mm -hmm. rattled me. But anyways, it was a good episode. Lots of fun. Lots of uh, good stuff happening in the NHL. And I uh, appreciate everyone for listening. Appreciate you guys. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Ciao.